I'm Dori Chatel. I'm executive director of the Nonprofit Medical Education Institute, and it is my pleasure this evening or afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world, to uh, introduce my um, dear friend and mentor, Professor John William McD McDonald Agar. John graduated from Monash University Medical School in 1970 and trained in nephrology in Melbourne and University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, USA. In 1978, he returned to his home city of Geelong, where he established and ran a clinical nephrology practice until his retirement in February of 2020. John has published more than 250 peer review papers and abstracts, four book chapters, two dialysis related books, and more than 90 kidney views blog as blogs as the hemodialysis advisor and internet consultant to the Wisconsin based Medical Education Institute since 2010. He has been an invited lecturer on dialysis topics in 16 countries, especially on his three pet subjects nocturnal home hemo extended hour and higher frequency hemodialysis and environmental sustainability in nephrology, founding the global concepts of green dialysis and green nephrology. Among his awards for contrib contributions in nephrology are the Order of Australia Medal, Australia's highest honor, the Priscilla Kincaid Smith Medal and the International Society of Hemodialysis Spilut Twardowski Lifetime Achievement Award in Hemodialysis. We are offering continuing education credits for nurses and technicians. There's a link that I posted in the chat and I will post that again at the end. And I'm going to go ahead and let John get started. This particular slide set is one that I uh, have given uh, many years now to the Deakin University student group. This is a group of trainee doctors at my university, Deakin University in Geelong. So it was originally designed for medical students. Um, however, I have tried to adapt it for this audience. I want to make sure that you remember that uh, some of this will have some uh, rather more complex stuff, uh, but that's fine. If that's the case, uh, you can do the best you can with that. The usual teaching approach to the therapy, the treatment, the medicines that we use in chronic kidney disease is this is the pathology, this is what's wrong, so this is the drug you should use. I turn that around and I say, well, if this is the treatment we're giving, what then is the pathology underlying it that leads us to use that treatment? And so uh, I'm turning the question and answer, if you like, in 180 degrees. The series of slides that I'm going to give today will examine the, the whole of uh, chronic kidney disease. And this is not dialysis specific. It involves chronic kidney disease and dialysis, though perhaps with a leaning towards those patients who are already on dialysis. And we'll look at that through the prism of the treatment sheet. And by exploring the treatment sheet, uh, as I say, this will hopefully open a window to you on the causes and underlying issues that underpin chronic kidney disease. So now let's explore treatment uh, of kidney disease, I guess, my way. Uh, I do make a few caveats to start with. The firstly, the slides don't appear in any particular order or ranking of significance. They actually are simply the order that they popped into my head. Now I could change that around and probably I should, but I just haven't had the uh, the time or the energy to rewrite the entire talk. So remember that these are not necessarily coming in order of uh, importance or significance. I have had a habit all of my clinical life of using Sundays on a particular reason. There are no interns and residents and registrars, or as you would call them, fellows around uh, to mess up my time so I can pop in, uh, enjoy the solitude of a Sunday morning working around uh, I can take my red pen with me, uh, and so I hop in the car to attend my hospital, which you can see there, with much optimism, with the intention of slashing the number of pills on the treatment sheets of my inpatient population. Later that morning, I come home, I'm chastened, I'm defeated, uh, because 
As I go down their treatment sheet, it, it really is quite hard to think, well, what will I remove? What can I remove? What doesn't need to be there? And generally speaking, I often haven't removed a single medication. So let me take you on a tour of a typical uh, chronic kidney disease uh, and or dialysis treatment sheet. There are, as I say, four caveats. The medication list is in no particular order. It doesn't represent uh, relative importance. And this is important for you because many of you or most of you are probably from the United States. The medications that I list and use are as they are used in Australia and New Zealand. Now, we use the same basic generic medication, the same uh, formula, but they will be marketed under different names. And one of my pet hates is people who use marketing names to describe their medication. I'm on Lipitor, for example. No, you're not. You're actually on Atorvastatin. I'm on Cavia. No, you're not. You're on Herbisartan. So uh, you will find that there will be some names here that may be slightly less known to you, but that is because I use the generic names for medications as we go. This is routine practice in this country. We use generic drug, drug names here and not the trade name that has been randomly dreamed up by some marketing person in a pharmaceutical company. We don't think that's the right way to describe medication. So for users from the United States of this slide set, uh, while the generic approach may confuse some of you, and I apologize if that's the case, uh, I actually don't apologize for using that approach because drugs should be known uh, under their correct names. And the same drug is often represented uh, by, uh, or produced, made, and marketed by several companies and therefore marketed under several names. And I'm going to use one example here. I think this is confusing and wrong. Let's take the, the drug atorvastatin, uh, just as an example. And this applies, of course, to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, some of these names will be different in your own countries. But in Australia alone, atorvastatin is marketed under one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different names. So you might go to your one chemist, one pharmacist, and they will provide you with Lipitor because they've done a deal with the company that provides Lipitor, atorvastatin under the trade name of Lipitor. You might go to the pharmacy down the street and they will give you Trovas. They are the same drug. And this can be confusing because all too often, uh, they all contain the same ingredient. Too often the packet name reflects marketing and not medicine. This can sometimes lead to double prescribing so that you, a patient may not know that Lipitor and Trovas are the same thing. And if they've gone to different pharmacies, they may double dip. So US practice apparently is to push the brand and not the active agent. I would ask you and encourage you to read the packet and learn the name of the active ingredient. And this applies, as I say, to most drugs. Okay, that's there the caveats before we start. Remember, these slides are not in order of importance, but I have started with erythropoietin. So here we have erythropoietin or EPO, if you like. Uh, it's a peptide hormone, is produced by the kidney. And as kidney function declines, it's made in uh, some specialized cells in the what's called the interstitium of the kidney. But uh, the interstitium of the kidney fibroses as kidney disease progresses. And as kidney function declines, so too, in most cases, does the uh, production of EPO. People with polycystic kidney disease, and this is an oddity about polycystic kidney disease, their EPO production tends to be relatively maintained in contrast to most other forms of kidney disease. But nevertheless, just think of it as, as your kidney falls, so too does your EPO production. Now, EPO is important because it tells the bone marrow, that's the factory in our body which makes our blood, to make red blood cells. That's basically all it does. But without EPO, you can't make red cells. And so a condition called anemia 
spelt in the United States without the A. Treating anemia with EPO raises the red cell count, improves oxygen carrying capacity and distribution. Remember that it is your red cells that port your oxygen around your body. And therefore, if you've got less red cells, you can carry less oxygen. If conversely, if you can raise the red cell count, you will improve oxygen delivery. So treating the anemia improves oxygen carrying capacity, improves the symptoms of anemia, and reduces the tendency of anemic patients to develop left ventricular hypertrophy. That means uh, an increase in the muscle mass of the main pumping chamber of the heart. And the reason that happens is the heart has to work harder to push more red cell poor blood around the body to deliver enough oxygen for the body to work well. In Australia, we have a target hemoglobin. I have in my unit a target hemoglobin of 120. Uh, I know it's less in the United States, and I think the logic behind that is uh, significantly flawed. Uh, we tend to shoot for higher hemoglobins. And as we shoot for a higher hemoglobin, our patients are less anemic, their oxygen carrying capacity is better, and they actually feel better. There are different ways to administer EPO. You can give it uh, by a subcutaneous injection, for example, in patients who are yet to be on dialysis and therefore don't have a route into their uh, bloodstream given every second day, uh, or the same applies to PD, or in hemodialysis patients, it's usually given intravenously. The consequences of EPO use are that it does impact on iron status, uh, apart from helping to reverse the anemia, it does uh, demand uh, a greater iron supply. And we'll come to iron in a minute, but that's important. So people who are on EPO commonly require some supplemental iron in some form or other. There are risks to uh, a hemoglobin overshoot or blood count overshoot. That's often overplayed, I think. In the early days, uh, there was concern that uh, people would clot their fistulas if you push their blood count up too high. That usually indicates a poor fistula and not uh, anything to do with your hemoglobin. And there are other, I think, as I say, overplayed risks of a overshoot in hemoglobin. And we don't get our knickers in a knot too much about that when it happens. However, if the uh, hemoglobin gets up to 125 or 130, will stop their EPO until their hemoglobin settles back into the 110 range and then cautiously and gently reintroduce it. There's been a debate, and I'm not going to go into this in great detail here, it doesn't help. But in fact, if you under dialyze somebody, that leads to a worse anemia. And that requires an increased use of EPO. So poor dialysis leads to an increased demand for EPO. And because that is a very costly substance, in the United States to reduce the EPO costs, they determined a lower target hemoglobin. That I think is a poor way of approaching the management of a clinical problem. So it was all around cost. Now, more dialysis, better dialysis, leads to a lesser requirement for EPO. For example, many of our nocturnal dialysis patients are either not on EPO at all, or they are on minimal amounts of EPO given infrequently. So better dialysis diminishes your need for EPO, allows you to achieve a higher hemoglobin without high doses of EPO. And of course, that leads to a lower EPO cost. And this is the approach that is taken in, for example, in ANZ, the European Union, UK, Japan, and so on. So the debate about EPO and hemoglobin targets actually all stemmed from cost. Now, I'm not going to go into that in detail now. It's a complex and sometimes bitter argument, but I do want you to understand that low hemoglobin targets are not necessarily a clinically good thing. 
Next thing on the list, because we've talked about EPO, is iron. Now, I said before that EPO demands an iron supplementation in most patients. Iron uptake is low in chronic kidney disease. There's several reasons for that. Firstly, iron uptake from the gut, the absorption of iron is diminished in people with chronic kidney disease. Now, there's a reason for that. It is all to do with a substance called hepcidin. Remember, this is a talk that's being designed originally for medical students. And at this point, I talk to some length about what hepcidin is. But hepcidin is the substance in the body that regulates the passage of iron across cell membranes. It is increased in people with chronic kidney disease. And what that does is it reduces the gut uptake of iron. In addition, people with chronic kidney disease, and particularly people on dialysis, have increased losses. I mean, you lose some blood every time you're on dialysis into the dialysis lines at the end. That's, it's not a big amount, but it's enough. And that happening three times a week, uh, every week of the year, plus all the blood that you lose for uh, people taking blood tests and so on, there are losses in chronic kidney disease that matter. In addition, because you're using EPO, that increases the demand for iron. So EPO therapy needs a lot of iron, which can be given intravenously, for example, in hemodialysis patients, or by bolus in people on peritoneal dialysis or in chronic kidney disease. Iron absorption doesn't cut the mustard because if we go back up here, you'll notice that there's reduced uptake because of hepcidin. So you can get people to swallow truckloads of oral iron and they'll just pop out the bottom end in your poo with the same amount of iron as they travel into the top end in your mouth. So oral iron, generally speaking, is insufficient. Iron doses are usually gauged by measuring the iron stores in the body. And this is done by measuring two substances, which we use together, the serum ferritin and the TSAT. Now there are traps to the serum ferritin. So it is important that you take both of these into account and not just the ferritin dose. Ferritin is routinely regarded as the measure of iron stores, but uh, there is a bit more to ferritin than just that. We aim for ferritin levels of somewhere between four and 500. I believe in the United States, you aim for levels significantly higher than that. We have a problem with that, to be honest. And we aim for a TSAT somewhere, a saturation of transferrin, somewhere between 20 and 50%. Now, US practice seems to be to run a higher ferritin level. And one could argue, is this wise or even necessary? And the answer is no to both. Because too much iron increases your susceptibility to infection. And it's not a, a necessary thing to overload somebody with iron. This is, uh, we believe, the appropriate and sufficient amount. We have to move quite quickly through this to get through. You can see all the columns on the far side that I have to populate. Uh, so we've got to keep moving here. But Folic acid is another substance which is low in chronic kidney disease. We don't really understand quite what the reasons for poor absorption are. And so I, I have to gloss over that because the answer is I don't know, but I don't know that it is known. Folic acid losses are high in dialysis. It's water soluble. And anything that's water soluble, and it's a small molecule, so it can actually pass across the dialysis membrane and be dialyzed off during dialysis. Why is folate important? Well, it's one of the many substances which is necessary for making red blood cells. That's what erythropoiesis means. Along with iron and folic acid and various other substances, folate is required to make good red cells. It's also, and this is again medical student stuff, required for degrading a substance called homocysteine. Now this is actually hugely important. We gloss over this. Homocysteine accumulates in people who are on dialysis, not just hemodialysis, but it accumulates in dialysis patients. To remove it requires time. 
It's a slow or mover across the membrane. And so it requires long hours of dialysis to adequately remove homocysteine. If you like, you can think of it in the same breath as you might think of beta-2 microglobulin, though they are very different substances. Homocysteine is a potent uremic toxin and it drives atherosclerosis. So if you accumulate homocysteine, that promotes atherosclerosis and increases the risk of heart and blood vessel disease. Uh, it also leads to decreased levels of other certain uh, substances in the blood. So folic acid is important and homocysteine is important. Other substances that are also important for making red blood cells is B vitamin B12 and pyridoxine. And vitamin B and C are vital as well, are small, water-soluble, dialyzable, uh, need to be replaced once dialysis starts. So most patients will be on some form of multivitamin pill. So here we are, we've got a person who's on EPO, iron, folic acid, and a multivitamin. And when you look at that, there are actually reasons why all of those are there. Then we come to uh, calcium and phosphate. Calcium and phosphate is a fraught area in um, dialysis, and you will all likely have had your battles with controlling phosphate. Phosphate retention is a major problem in chronic kidney disease. We have an obligatory phosphate intake in our food. And as our kidney function declines, our ability to excrete phosphate diminishes. So if you've got an obligatory intake, but your capacity to remove it by your own kidneys diminishes, ultimately it will begin to accumulate. And when it accumulates, it combines with calcium to create a substance or a thing we call the calcium phosphate product. Now, those of you who did chemistry at school will remember if you have two things on one side, they tend to make a combination on the other. If you add phosphate here, it pushes that equation across. So you get more calcium phosphate made and calcium phosphate in simplest terms is limestone. So if you have a high phosphate, you precipitate a limestone, which then gets deposited in the soft tissues and blood vessels of the body and leads to things like accelerated atherosclerosis or vascular disease. So phosphate's an important little beastie. Most dialysis mechanisms remove phosphate very badly, but nocturnal dialysis removes Sufficient phosphate, indeed, long and frequent nocturnal dialysis, removes so much phosphate that you may have read in places that people who are on nocturnal dialysis need phosphate replacement. We can remove so much phosphate with long, slow, gentle, frequent dialysis that phosphate is actually too low and needs to be put back again. So Common normal dialysis doesn't remove enough, so it accumulates. High frequency, long extended dialysis removes so much that sometimes it needs to be even replaced. And we know now that eight hours alternate night, that means nocturnal dialysis every second night, is just about tickety-boo to keep phosphate levels in the ideal range without the requirement for any phosphate binders. So of course, these patients don't need phosphate binders. They may sometimes even need phosphate replacement, but long, slow, eight hour dialysis, three and a half times a week, in other words, alternate night, is achieves about ideal phosphate balance. To control phosphate in normal dialysis patients, in that's what I would describe as adequate but not optimum dialysis, that's the standard three sessions a week for uh, four to five hours, or in the United States, much less. You need binders to attract, to capture phosphate so that not so much is circulating in the bloodstream. 
We use oral binders. Some will have known, I think these are Tums in the United States or something like that, calcium carbonate and uh, aluminium hydroxide. I put a question mark here because we actually use aluminium hydroxide. I know it's a red rag to a bull in the United States, but it is pound for pound the best and cheapest phosphate binder. And many of the reasons why people got upset about aluminium have been negated in subsequent talks. Uh, Dory, I've got a uh, blog on aluminium hydroxide, aluminium uh, or alutabs, as we call them here, at your blog site. And that's something you could perhaps point people to later on if they want to read a little bit more about aluminium hydroxide as, a, as an effective binder. Both of these bind phosphate in the gut and allow le to form inabsorbable calcium phosphate in the gut. And we poo that out in our feces, therefore increasing our phosphate loss via the gut and diminishing phosphate available for absorption. Now, the risks of calcium binders are the, of themselves. They may aggravate vascular calcification. We've talked about aluminium toxicity, but I think those potential toxicities were overplayed in the 1970s and 80s when we didn't understand quite as much as we do now about the reasons for aluminium toxicity. And it's important to know that they don't just bind phosphate, they bind other stuff as well. So for example, if you're on thyroid pills because you've got thyroid disease and you're taking binders, much of the thyroxin that you swallow gets bound by the binder and goes out in the poo. And so you're getting a lower than intended dose of your thyroid hormone. So there are things to know about phosphate binders that we tend to forget. But they're cheap, they're easy to get, they're easy to take. They're the old style phosphate binders. Now, in terms of the second generation binders, we come to uh, two substances called cervelomere and lanthanum. These are newer agents that have emerged. They uh, tended to replace the older binders uh, used around the world. Cervelomere, commonly in this country known as Renagel, is a non-calcium, non-aluminium phosphate binder. They bind calcium, but they're costly, have a number of reported side effects and intolerances, particularly lanthanum, which is actually effectively diatomaceous earth. That's the stuff you put in your swimming pool filter, that white powder. That is a phosphate binder, but you're actually taking swimming pool filter when you're swallowing your pill of lanthanum, uh, and that tends to constipate people a bit. One of the ways around all of this is to use a multi-blend with small doses of several agents. And that can be a useful ploy to minimize some of the side effects and yet get sufficient phosphate binding. But, and I repeat this, the best way to control phosphate is to do good dialysis. And longer, slower, and more frequent dialysis is the answer. And remember that people who are accessing that type of dialysis don't need binders at all. There is the, the crux of the matter, better dialysis, longer treatment. Next, we come to calcitriol, or as some people call it, calcitriol. This is vitamin D. Now, it is a fascinating organ, it really is. It does so many things. People just think of it as an excretory organ. But when you think about it, it makes EPO that controls your red cell production and anemia. It creates vitamin D, which is vitally important to many of the functions of your body. And the kidney actually converts inactive to active vitamin D. And active vitamin D has a terrible name. It's called 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, and there's an extra C in there by mistake. I haven't noticed that. Uh, I'll have to take that out. But it's 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol. And what that substance does, that's active vitamin D, it increases your gastrointestinal uptake of calcium. It's all this business of it, calcium and phosphate, it's a really, really complex area. And, and we don't understand it as well as we should either. 
And how the hell can we explain it to patients? It's extremely difficult. I could do a one hour talk on calcium and phosphate and only scratch the surface and still you go away scratching your heads. In chronic kidney disease, calcium uptake is decreased. And so 125 is important to try and counter that. Parathyroid hormone is stimulated by a fall in calcium level. So if your calcium uptake is decreased, that decreases calcium, stimulates your parathyroid hormone, triggers your parathyroid glands to produce a, a hormone called parathyroid. It's all kind of rings and circles and roundabouts. But an increase in parathyroid hormone activates little cells they're kind of like Pac-Man. I think of them as, remember the old game Pac-Man that you used to play on the early computers? Uh, these little people used to went and go around and gobbled up dots and the occasional ghost. I think of osteoclasts as like little Pac-Man at the surface of bones, chomping away at bone. Osteoclasts destroy old bone and allow new bone to be made by osteo blasts. So we have in our bone two sets of cells, osteoblasts that make bone, osteoclasts that remove old bone, if you like. We think of bone as being just bone, but it is in a state of constant turnover and flux under the control of these two little cells, blasts and clasts. Thyroid hormone activates osteoclasts, which release calcium from bone in response to the low calcium level that stimulated parathyroid hormone. So calcium levels fall, parathyroid is stimulated, PTH production is increased, PTH activates osteoclasts, osteoclasts release calcium from bone, calcium is restored. So it's a kind of a round circle there. Osteoclast or PTH promotes bone reabsorption and ultimately will lead to what's called hyperparathyroid bone disease. Treating with vitamin D promotes an increase in calcium uptake, which suppresses PTH production and reduces parathyroid hormone. So if the original problem is calcium decrease in bone up here, that leads to parathyroid stimulation that leads to PTH production, that leads to osteoclast activity, that releases calcium from bone, that restores calcium levels. If you give vitamin D, you increase the amount of calcium available so you negate that whole process. And that's why we give people calcitriol or calcitriol in people with chronic kidney disease. Recently, Sinocalcid, which is what's called a calcimimetic. It, in other words, it mimics, mimes calcium. It fools the, the parathyroid glands into thinking the calcium level is higher than it really is. So sinocalcid is another bullet in the gun, if you like, to manage patients with parathyroid disease. It is, however, despite being effective, it is expensive. And in this segment, finally, there is hypertension. Now, in a little email discussion before this session started, in response to an email from David Leong in Singapore, who raised a number of important questions about the treatment of hypertension, I think what we'll do is do a separate and special uh, session on hypertension and dialysis and the management of hypertension in terms of the drug therapy. So I'm going to fairly quickly skip through that section today and we may construct around this particular slide a separate one hour session on understanding blood pressure in chronic kidney disease and dialysis patients because it's a very complex area. But Sufficient for today, remembering, a rise in blood pressure is almost part and parcel of most kidney diseases. It may either cause or be as a result of chronic kidney disease. The treatment of hypertension in chronic kidney disease has two aims. 
The first is to obviously control the blood pressure. And there are reasons why we need to do that. If your blood pressure goes way off scale, you're at risk of all sorts of unpleasant longer term things. But nevertheless, we do need to control your blood pressure. But in chronic kidney disease, particularly, hypertension is never easy to treat. So it's not an easy topic. And most people with chronic kidney disease require several drugs, or many people with chronic kidney disease require several drugs to treat their hypertension. This is the rule rather than the exception. In standard common or garden, out there in the community, what we call essential hypertension, many patients will get away with small doses of a single drug or maybe a single antihypertensive and a small dose of diuretic, uh, and their blood pressures are fine. But in chronic kidney disease, that ain't the case. People with chronic kidney disease have difficult to treat, no, never easy to treat high blood pressure. Now, at this point, I've chopped out of this session a whole section about angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors. I'm going to suggest we ignore this piece here because we'll come back to that in a specialised talk on hypertension later. There are other, apart from ACEs and ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, they're drugs that end in PRIL or angiotensin receptor blockers, they are drugs that end in sartan. So prills and sartans are the primary agents we use now in the management of people with chronic kidney disease and hypertension. But there are other antihypertensive drugs as well. Again, we'll talk about these and flesh these out more in a future session on hypertension. But they include things like calcium blockers, beta blockers, which are often also used to uh, assist people with ischemic heart disease. There are other candidate antihypertensive drugs. There are diuretics. They're remembering that the kidney becomes slowly resistant to diuretics. So higher and higher doses are required and drugs like thiazides don't work very well in people with advanced chronic kidney disease. So this whole area is a fraught area and we'll talk about it in a separate session. Then there is, as you call it, angina or angina, which is pretty common in people who have chronic kidney disease. Obviously, older people have more ischemic heart disease than younger people, but ischemic heart disease expressed as a symptom of angina, which is uh, usually described as chest pain on exertion, is a result of a number of factors including long-standing high blood pressure, including high blood cholesterol and lipid triglyceride, mixed hyperlipidemia, which is an issue in people with chronic kidney disease. As a result of perhaps those two things and also abnormalities in calcium and phosphate and homocysteine, so you could add those to those two here, so long-standing hypertension, hyperlipidemia, calcium phosphate abnormalities, hyperhomocysteinemia, all lead to accelerated atherosclerosis on top of any familial or genetic or whatever other predisposing factors, smoking that might affect your blood vessels. So your blood vessels in people with chronic kidney disease under attack from almost every corner of the globe. Plus, People with chronic kidney disease are anemic, and so the heart muscle is being supplied with less available oxygen. All of these things mixed together like in a mortar and pestle and ultimately lead to blood vessel disease in the heart muscle, and as a result of that, a risk of what's called ischemic heart disease expressed as angina. We've talked briefly earlier about the effect of anemia on developing this thing we call concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. That means a general global thickening of the uh, heart muscle, which in turn, wrong spelling there, I'll have to fix that, 
which in turn leads to parts of the heart muscle having relatively less available oxygen than other parts. And the part that is most commonly affected is what we call the subendocardial layer, which is the deepest layer of the heart muscle when you sort of look at a heart. This leads to either typical or sometimes uh, unusual forms of angina, poor heart muscle contractility, in other words, it doesn't pump very well, and ultimately to failure of the pumping chamber as an effective uh, driver of circulation. Histology means looking under the microscope. When we look at the arterial disease of patients with chronic kidney disease, again, remembering these lecture notes were primarily uh, designed for medical students. So there is language and, and concepts in here that are perhaps beyond some people to follow easily. And I sort of do apologize and don't apologize for that. But the histology, looking under the microscope at the arterial disease of chronic kidney disease, it shows us a very different pattern. So people who don't have chronic kidney disease may have coronary artery disease, absolutely. You'll know lots of people who've had their coronary arteries stented or bypassed or whatever, who don't have chronic kidney disease. People with chronic kidney disease have the same ultimate treatments, but the type of narrowing of the coronary arteries is quite different. And there's a lot of work being done at the moment about understanding this, and I think we do understand this reasonably well. It doesn't help for me to try and tease that out with you, other than to say that chronic kidney disease, heart disease, isn't quite the same as heart disease in patients who don't have kidney disease. Hmm. The aggressive treatment of high blood pressure and anemia can help to reduce the angina, regress the uh, thickening of the left ventricle, reduce heart failure and improve exercise performance. So uh, treating hypertension and anemia are useful in managing those outcomes of chronic kidney disease, heart disease. Then we come to lipids. These are commonly the statins. There are other types of uh, drugs that we can use to uh, manage people who have hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia means high lipid fat. So this is high levels of fat in the blood. So that's what hyperlipidemia means. And usually it's a combination of an increase in cholesterol and in triglycerides. There are lots of blood fats, heaps and heaps and heaps of blood fats. But the two we most commonly measure and think about uh, that kind of give us a window onto all the other fats, uh, cholesterol and triglyceride. And an elevation of these two are found in most people with kidney disease. And in some cases, for example, in people who have had nephrotic syndrome, this can be profound. High fat levels in the blood promotes an increased rate of atherosclerosis. That means sclerosing or damage to narrowing of the blood vessels. And of course, that leads to an increase in both coronary artery and peripheral vascular disease, people who have what's called claudication, people who have poor circulation, particularly to their peripheries and particularly to their legs. It is aggravated and compounded by a high calcium phosphate product and calcium vascular. So all of these things, you can see here how when you cook a pie, you just don't put in meat and peas. You use salt and water and spices and a whole variety of different things. Otherwise, it would be a very bland pie. In people who have blood vessel disease and chronic kidney disease, you can see that there's so much going on. It's not just their blood fat levels. It's not just their hypertension. It's not just their anemia, their hyperlipidemia, uh, their calcium and phosphate, their PTO. It's all in there and kind of being stirred around together uh, and popping out the other end with terrible vascular calcification. This then accelerates the decline if you've got vascular calcification. That's occurring in the kidney. 
So if you've got blood vessel disease, that's not just in the heart or in the arteries to the legs, it's in the arteries and blood vessels everywhere, including your native kidneys. And so that can accelerate the decline in your kidney function. On the plus side, we know that the treatment of high cholesterol with statins independently helps to reduce fibrosis in the kidney. And that's a good thing. Uh, and we need to learn more about that because at the moment, the understanding of that side of statins is quite rudimentary. But our treatment of high cholesterol in the blood, hyperlipidemia, is primarily with statins, but statins can cause trouble. One of the symptoms of statins, blessedly, this is rare. So not everybody who's going to be put on statins is going to have inflammatory muscle disease. It's in the realms of 0.1 to 0.5 of 1%. So it's not a lot of people who get this sort of problem, but it is a problem when it occurs. We can also use other lipid fat lowering drugs like azetamibi and fibrates. And there are some newer ones coming along yet, which are not yet fully evaluated, but nevertheless, lowering the blood fat levels is an aspiration that we attempt to fulfill in people with chronic kidney disease. And then there are the proton pump inhibitors. These are things that we take for indigestion. They often end in the ending zole. So there is a meprazole and prantoprazole and take your picazole. There's lots and lots of zoles. They all are uh, these things called proton pump inhibitors or PPIs. And they all have the advantage of reducing upper, particularly upper gastrointestinal inflammatory disease like esophagitis and uh, gastritis and the treatment of indigestion, if you like. They lower gastric ulceration and they lower esophagitis, two things which are common in people who have chronic kidney disease, partly because you're tipping all these pills down your throat. So that of itself has its own set of issues. If you're using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, that is the anti-arthritic type medications or aspirin, they can exacerbate, make worse the inflammatory disease in the upper gastrointestinal tract and that then will lead your doctor to suggest that you take a protein pump inhibitor, a Zol, if you like, to try and settle down that, or alternatively, of course, stop your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and aspirin. But many people are taking aspirin for very good reasons, because it's helpful in sustaining blood vessel function. So every step of the way we're going here, it's like uh, the push me, pull you animal in uh, Dr. Doolittle. Things are pulling in both directions and the balance in the middle is where we always try to aim for. Protein pump inhibitors reduce the risk of ulceration, gastrointestinal symptoms and uh, any upper intestinal bleeding that might be associated with either that ulceration or that inflammatory disease. But then there's the other side of the coin, as there always is, because protein pump inhibitors can independently cause interstitial nephritis, and they can impact on the efficacy of a number of drugs that we take. So protein pump inhibitors may diminish the effectiveness of things like phosphate binding drugs and other agents. So there's good and there's bad. And somehow we've got to try and find a way through the middle. Now this slide, when I was doing this, I thought, well, why on earth did I leave this to the third last slide? In fact, the patient who has chronic kidney disease or who is on dialysis has chronic kidney disease, is on dialysis because there was something wrong in the first place. So a primary kidney disease. And that primary kidney disease may require ongoing management. It may have been glomerulonephritis. 
people who've had nephritis may have been on steroids or cyclophosphamide or rituximab or azathioprine or Imuran, if you like, mycophenolate, cyclosporin. These are all drugs that are used, and there are others, in the treatment of glomerulonephritis. And just because you are going through chronic kidney disease doesn't necessarily mean that the management of that primary disease should stop. Indeed, there's every reason to say it should continue. One of the major causes of chronic kidney disease, you will all be aware, hardly it hasn't raised its head in this talk today, is diabetes. It is the highest or largest single cause of chronic kidney disease in Western civilizations. That diabetes needs to obviously continue to be treated. So people may be on oral hypoglycemic agents, blood sugar lowering drugs. There are multiple oral medications for the management of diabetes, or they might be on insulin. They might be on metformin, but then that's a problem in itself because it needs to be stopped if your kidney function declines far enough to be a risk of causing a condition called lactic acidosis. So your diabetic medications are ongoing in the background. And as kidney disease progresses, the management of diabetes becomes increasingly difficult. People might have recurrent urinary tract infections. For example, they may have reflux nephropathy and require intermittent antibiotic or even sometimes uh, longer courses of antibiotics or urinary alkalinizing agents. They may have multiple myeloma or other forms of malignancy which require ongoing management with chemotherapeutic agents. And there's a whole lot of other stuff. But what you're getting here is an understanding that apart from all of this stuff that we've talked about, PPIs, lipids, antianginals, calcitriol, folic acid, iron, EPO, so on and so forth, there is the steroid, the um, basic disease, which of itself may require complex ongoing management. Then there's acidosis. This is a really difficult area because people with chronic kidney disease tend to develop an acidy level in their blood. I'm not going to go into that in detail except to say acidosis accompanies most patients with chronic kidney disease to some degree. Acidosis can aggravate kidney bone disease, it can affect PTH and vitamin D. And there are studies that show that if you can reverse or counter that tendency to acid in the blood with alkali therapy, that can help to slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. And this can be, so acidosis, and the way we correct acidosis is we use sodium bicarbonate. That's mother's baking soda. But we put it in a pill because if anybody's tried to go to the kitchen cupboard and take a teaspoonful of baking soda, you will froth at the mouth and feel very unpleasant. And so we contain it inside a pill so that it can get down inside you without causing unpleasantness on the way. But look at sodium bicarbonate. What is standing out at you in sodium bicarbonate? It's a great alkali, but look, it's full of sodium. Sodium and bi sodium bicarbonate adds a sodium load. And that may then aggravate both hypertension and left ventricular failure and fluid retention. So give on the one hand and take away at the other. So where's the balance between the two? A trade-off might be needed between the desire to control acidosis and the effect of sodium on blood volume. And one is bad, one is good, one is good, one is bad. Again, it's back to Dr. Doolittle and the push me, pull you animal. If possible, if possible, acidosis should be corrected with a goal of achieving a sodium bicarbonate in excess of 22 millimole per litre. Sorry, I don't know what that is in whatever units you use in the United States. But the difficulty with this is the risk of promoting hypertension and therefore meaning that you've got to increase your antihypertensive drugs or your diuretics or whatever it might be. So again, it's difficult. 
And then I'm on my Sunday ward round and I've been thinking, which of all of these can I take off the patient's medication sheet? And I've come to the biggest list of all, and that is the other stuff. People with chronic kidney disease often are nauseated and sometimes require anti-emesis. That means drugs to suppress nausea. They may have obstructive sleep apnea. Up to 50% of chronic kidney disease have obstructive sleep apnea and may require not only CPAP at night to help them sleep, but uh, medication, which either may be needed or indeed from some patient's point of view, demanded. They may, well, wouldn't you be anxious and depressed? Anxiety and depression is not only grossly under-recognized in chronic kidney disease, but it's also very difficult to treat. And some patients may need anxiolytics, that means drugs to suppress anxiety or antidepressants to treat understandable depression. And then there's discomfort and cramps and restless legs. There are all sorts of remedies that uh, can be used to try and improve cramp and restless legs. We tend to use a drug called clonazepam. It works very well. But again, it's another drug. It's yet another drug. So we don't use that. It's a nasty drug, best avoided. But the best treatment of all for cramp, discomfort and restless legs is slower dialysis. And we've dealt with that in previous talks. And I've got a whole talk on the management of cramp coming up later in this series. There's constipation which is particularly common in in peritoneal dialysis patients, where patients may require some form of uh, loosening agent, for example, lactulose. Then patients, because of all of this, they go out and self-medicate. They think, oh, God, I've got to have something. They go and see the Chinese herbalist, and the herbalist gives them Chinese herbs. And if one of those includes a thing called aristocolic acid, you're in big trouble because that's potently toxic. I'm pausing purposefully at this point to let all this sink in, that you are being treated with one more or all of these agents. And you are being treated with one more or all of these agents for good reasons and with good purpose and with great intent and with every hope for your benefit, but the complexity of the management of chronic kidney disease, and this slide set only touches the surface of that, is immense. And pity the dialysis and the chronic kidney disease patient, for this is not easy stuff. And just for a a little while, pity your doctor for trying to steer your way in some reasonable way through the complexities of this because it's not easy for either side of the desk. So you can now see why each Sunday morning, late on Sunday morning, I come home chastened, defeated because all of those pills are there for a reason and often I just don't manage to remove a single tablet. I drive home, I'm sad, I'm depressed. The polypharmacy of chronic kidney disease is at least for now, seemingly inescapable. There are pathophysiological reasons why all these medications crowd the treatment sheet of patients with chronic kidney disease and of those who are on dialysis. Do they all make a difference? Well, I kind of like to think they do. I hope they do. Otherwise, I wouldn't write them on the treatment sheet. But for now, at least, this slide set will show you why chronic kidney disease, the most medicated patients of all in any medical ward. The complexities for patients who attempt to do as they're told and take their medicine is mind boggling. You will be told this tablet has to be taken before meals, after meals, during meals, God knows whatever. And for you to be able to find your way through this, they should be taken several times a day, before, with or after food. Many are produced in different sized 
packs even. They come in tens or fifteens or twenty eights or thirties or sixties or a hundreds. And the size packs actually then means that you have to have haphazard visits to the pharmacy to get your repeats because you run out of that one two days before you run out of that one. And over three or four months, that uh, two days becomes four, six, eight, ten. And so you are constantly chasing your pharmacy to get repeats of medications out of order, if you like. The societal and individual costs of this are mind boggling. And I know that few of you in your US health system, if you can call the US healthcare system a system at all, and I strongly believe it is nothing such as that, few of you can actually even afford your medications. I've seen people who can't take their insulin because they, it's just too expensive. Uh, here in Australia and New Zealand, they're both truly lucky countries. We have universal health care and free medication. So at least that side of the issue is taken out of the equation for patients. They can get their medicines, they can afford their medicines, and it is available at the same price for everybody. And that price is negligible in terms of our take-home pay. But we have a cheek to call our patients non-compliant. How can we call patients non-compliant? And there's that famous line, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And I think we on the treatment side of this need to remember that when we're looking at our patient across the desk, because those shoes really hurt. Let's just hope there will be a better way one day. But in the meantime, uh, thank you for listening. And I, I know that's been a complex talk. I know that there's probably left more questions than I've answered but I hope that you have managed to follow at least some of what I've been talking about. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. That was terrific. I'm not unmuting everybody because I think it's just gonna be easier if we don't all try to talk at once, but I did ask for questions and did get some questions. So um, one of the questions was, how is acidosis measured? Acidosis uh, is, essentially measured by a blood test. We measure your blood by serum, your serum bicarbonate, mm. which is the um, uh, amount of uh, alkali, if you like, in your blood. We can also measure, of course, your pH. Uh, that is the, um, it's a chemical uh, term uh, for the uh, difference between acidosis and uh, alkalosis. Those of you who are keen gardeners will know that you have a uh, acid base um, probe that you can go out and stick in the ground and it will tell you if, you're, if your soil is too acid or too uh, alkali. And if it's too alkali, you add a bit of acid uh, in one form or other. And the same applies to the blood. But in people with chronic kidney disease, there is a slow but creeping inability to excrete acid. So very slowly, the blood becomes a little bit acidy. And so that leads to a fall in the uh, uh, pH, if you measure it. But a simpler way of doing it is just simply to look at the serum bicarbonate, that's HCO3. And anybody who's ever looked at their uh, uh, bloods will note that there is an HCO3. But a lot of people don't take, pay too much attention to that, but it actually matters. And if your, if your bicarbonate level is too low, then that would be an indication to try and reverse that with some baking soda in a pill, uh, give you some sodium bicarbonate. But uh, again, I notice Nancy's here, uh, the issue is sodium. And uh, I'm not going to go into that in any great detail, but that's where the balancing trick comes in because there's not much else in our uh, pocket to use against acidosis other than bicarbonate, hmm. sodium bicarbonate. Okay. Um, we got another question that said, and you're, you're going to like this question. This is right up your alley. In looking at that list of meds, how many of them could be discontinued potentially if someone did? Now, she said daily 
uh, hemo. I am I'm changing it a little bit to longer and or more frequent hemo. Yeah. But I think daily doesn't help. I knew you were going to uh, say daily that. doesn't help if it's <laughs> daily and short. If you're, it's hours of dialysis per week. It's hours of con membrane contact time that matter. Uh, so somebody who does daily dialysis, let's say six, two and a half hour, se two or two and a half hour sessions a week, is still getting only membrane contact time of maybe 12 to 15 hours if they're lucky. All right. That's not it. That's not, that doesn't mean more dialysis. More dialysis is the num the period of time in a given week that your blood comes in contact with dialysate across a membrane. Now, the only way to do that is long, frequent, slow dialysis. And that's where not, uh, the, the concepts of, if you like, of nocturnal dialysis. Even nocturnal dialysis done in a center, as it is in some places in the United States, which is often what, it's about six hours? No, I think it's usually eight. seven or eight. I do eight. It's right seven or eight. eight. But so even three then, times uh, a week, so there is a two-day gap. Yes, seven. so you've seven. got a two-day gap, and you're also your uh, accumulative time is perhaps twenty to twenty-four hours, give or take. Is that about right? Uh, in a week, 21. that that's getting close. 20. But um, if you take somebody who's on eight hours of dialysis, alternate nights, three and a half times a week, if you like, alternate nights, uh, that means that that person is getting. Uh, about 30 odd hours of dialysis a week. That is about break even point for phosphate. Over that, in the long frequent nocturnal that we do, for example, here in Geelong, we actually have to give phosphate back and we give it back by adding uh, fleet enema pack to the dialysate, uh, which is uh, phosphate. Uh, so that the patient can absorb some phosphate as opposed to not being able to get rid of enough. But short weekly contact time ain't enough. So frequency isn't the issue, it's duration. It's weekly duration. Does that make sense? I'm not, okay. I hope what I've else, answered. Bes besides the binders, what else can you get rid of if someone has more well, of course, weekly if you, if membrane? You, if you have long, slow, and uh, ideally volume controlled dialysis, you get rid of your blood pressure pills. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, our nocturnal patients just don't take blood pressure pills. Um, and, and I can say that quite categorically and comfortably. They don't. They don't take BP pills. They don't take phosphate binders. Their EPO dose is a third to a half of what it would otherwise be. Because they're not using so much EPO, their iron requirements are less. So the requirement to uh, give additional iron is so their epo uh, might be once a month if they're if they're lucky uh and in a small dose and their iron they may not need iron for a year or two and then we'll give them a little bit of a uh, a, a, a touch up with uh, some iron if their uh, if their tsat ferritins are falling but many of them are not taking iron at all so as you go across that whole uh, gamut of the treatment sheet, pretty much in every page, they're down. Now, uh, do they need calcitriol? Usually uh, not, okay? So, because uh, uh, their PTH levels are normal. Um, it, it's, it's a snowball effect across the entire uh, uh, treatment sheet. Um, th that's a very glib statement, obviously. Uh, uh, and you can point to individual in instances where that may or may not be so, but as a broad concept, that's true. Okay. I'm curious, and I have no idea if you know this or not, so if this isn't something you've thought about, just feel free to say I have no clue. Um, there's a lot of folks in the U.S. using CBD either for pain relief or for sleep. Do you have any thoughts about, is that used in Australia? Is that- CBD? Um, cannabinols, not, not THC, oh. but, but CBD. Actually, uh, some, people, some people just use THC in various- uh, The answer is, uh, to my knowledge here, none. Okay. 
not using those there. And what about drug interactions? When somebody's taking that many different drugs, oh, if there's a problem, how do you even pin down which one is doing what? It, exactly. Uh, I mean, I didn't go into that, but uh, the, the more you pile in, the more risk there's. I mean, I, I touched on that, for example, with uh, the use of phosphate binders and, and how they interact, for example, with uh, somebody who's on thyroxin. Or and, and thyroxine I just picked out of the uh, out of the blue. It could be a range of other medications that are impacted by, in terms of their absorbs uh, their their absorbability, their absorption from the uh, gastrointestinal tract, by the fact that you're taking a PPI or a phosphate binder, which is specifically there to stop you absorbing phosphate. Do you think it's just uh, uh, blocking phosphate? No, it's blocking a range of other things. So uh, that's uh, an issue. Obviously, uh, drug interactions are uh, a legion, and, and that, that's a, a topic of itself. But the more things you take, the more risk there is that one thing is going to fight another uh, or augment another, make uh, some uh, uh, agents don't uh, reduce, but can actually upregulate the the effectiveness of other agents. Uh, it, it's a minefield, Dory. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. um, uh, you, you, it, this is a down to the individual patient uh, and dealing with their doctor and saying, you know, is this fighting that? And the answer, of course, uh, almost e exclusively is yes. Um, Nancy had a question about the impact of PD on the need for various drugs, because of course PD seems like it's lots of membrane contact time, and it is, but as I was explaining in the comments, it's much less efficient. So thoughts on PD? Um, yes, uh, PD patients tend by and large to have less problems with phosphate uh, because phosphate uh, is removed uh, more efficiently by PD. That's the wrong, I've used the wrong term. Um, over, a, over a full week, phosphate removal, uh, it may not be as efficient minute to minute as a, as a hemodialysis membrane, but it's the duration of exposure that matters. Uh, and, the, and to a certain extent, PD is a very gentle therapy and it is an even therapy. It's not the sort of up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, challenge that hemodialysis is, whether that's in terms of um, solute uh, or in terms of volume, it's a, it's, a, it's a steady line, if you like. And bodies like to be uh, in a state of relative steadiness. So PD has a number of advantages. Not only uh, is the PD membrane uh, allow la the passage of larger molecules, and in that, in that way, phosphate behaves in that, as do uh, agents like uh, beta-2 microglobulin and homocysteine and so on. Um, so the clearance of those substances, despite the fact that uh, uh, in a minute-to-minute -minute basis, it's much less, because you're dialyzing over a long period of time, that's, that's useful. So yeah, people who are on PD do tend to have uh, lower demands for a number of the uh, agents that are used in, in hemodialysis patients. But do they still have um, uh, angina? Yes. Do they still have hypertension? Well, uh, you should be able to control their blood pressure uh, uh, with a good functioning PD membrane and an appropriate mix of, of uh, uh, PD fluids. So uh, often volume is better controlled in peritoneal dialysis patients. Uh, often uh, 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 calcium phosphate is better controlled. Are they still anemic? Yes, they are. Do they still need EPO? Yes, they do. Uh, all of those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. I'm not sure if I've explained that adequately, but in a short response, that's the best I can do. Hopefully. All right. I don't see any other questions. I just thought I would very quickly tell you that after learning from you for 11 years, I've just learned three new things tonight. So one of them was that? That, bind that binders do not just bind phosphate, which makes perfect sense, but I never thought about it before. So that's very interesting. And I, I will have to ponder that. That uh, low fo folate drives homocysteine. 
which I didn't realize or forgot, but it, okay. No, I no, no, no. You need folate to drive right. uh, homocysteine degradation. Yes. High folate drives down homocysteine, low folate, yes. The folate is homocysteine teeter-totter, I was not aware of. And um, I did not know that statins reduce interstitial fibrosis in the kidneys. So, no. See, I learn new things every time you do these. Oh, that's remarkable, Dory. I know. It, who would think I, I, you would think I know all the things already? And clearly that is not the case. <laughs> well, lovely to see you as always. I'm aware that that so was a really complex talk today. And, I, and there was an, uh, uh, plenty in there that uh, may have gone, you know, over the head. But, and, and if, but I hope that you've got some things, like Dory has taken away a couple of things there that she wasn't aware of that she now can have to think about. Uh, and, and that's good. That's, if we achieve that, we achieve something. All right. Well, have a wonderful night, day, whatever time it is for you. <laughs> and we will... We will do this again soon. Ciao.